But he begins this prayer in verse 22. And it's this wonderful testimony of what God uh, intends to do uh, on behalf of, of Israel. But in verse 41, he makes a very interesting statement. He says, also concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, when he comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When he, the foreigner, comes and prays toward this house, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. Now, I told you the struggle the Jews had is they in time, begin to think that the covenant blessing of salvation was exclusively for them. But what's Solomon saying? Even this temple that's being dedicated to the Lord, if the foreigner comes and professes faith in Jehovah and pray to him, answer his prayer as well. Why in the world would Solomon include this in his prayer of dedication to the temple unless he understood the Abrahamic covenant and God's purpose for the Jews, right? Right? As a matter of fact, in the design and construction of the Solomonic Temple, there are different courts built into the temple design, aren't there? And if you study those designs, you'll discover that there is one court that is designated as the court of the Gentiles. Why, if God didn't expect to be worshipped by Jew and Gentile, would he build into the design of the temple a place for for Gentiles or foreigners to come and worship him. Okay? Now, you need to remember what I just said about the core of the Gentiles because they have significance uh, in a few moments. But back to the account of Solomon. So he understands what the purpose of the nation of Israel was. And yet, by chapter 11, we see something very tragic transpire. It says, verse 1, Now the king... King Solomon loved many foreign wives, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. He says in verse 11, Because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant, my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. He goes on to say, because of David, I won't do it in your lifetime, but following you. What a tragic account. Here's this king of Israel who clearly understands what God's purpose was for the nation of Israel. But by the end of his life, he turns his attention from worshiping Jehovah to worshiping the gods of his foreign wives. And then the man who built the temple, the supreme place of worship for God on earth, builds temples to all his foreign gods on the hills surrounding that temple. This is a tragic account of a man who abandons his priestly role and, and pursuing a life of holiness and devotion to the true God and embraces idolatry. And God is so displeased with this that he promises he's going to divide the nation. This ushers the nation of Israel into just a very troubled uh, period for generation after generation. And we see the idolatry being brought back into the land. Now, the significance of this is when God had given the Jews the promised land and Joshua led them in, into the conquest, what God was doing there was he was purging the land of idolatry. 
Every single one of those cities that is conquered, starting with Jericho, and eventually Ai and so forth, there were 31 city kingdoms in the land of Israel. And each of them was ruled by a different king, and they each worshipped a different set of gods. So what God is doing in bringing the walls of Jericho down, he again is displaying his power, okay, that he alone is the true God, and he's defeating and crushing the gods that were worshipped among those who lived in the city of Jericho. In fact, that's a wonderful account of how God used Israel because there was a lady there named Rahab, wasn't there? And she chose to believe in the God of the spies, and she hung the scarlet cord out of her window, and when the walls fell, what happened? She and her family were preserved. Okay? And again, Hebrews 11 tells us that it was because of her faith that righteousness is attributed to her. Here's a Gentile. Paul uses the word uh, that they're, uh, he describes it this way, Gentiles are being grafted in to the Jews. We see this all the time. Matter of fact, I skipped over, but Moses' wife, okay? She's a Midianite. So is Jethro, his father-in-law. So even during the Exodus, you have Gentiles who are part of the children of Israel who are benefiting from the blessing of the covenant, okay? So God is using them throughout their history, and we, we see accounts of this. But um, following uh, the dividing of the kingdom, you see this horrific period where people like uh, Ahab and Jezebel come into power. And of course, they were worshipers of what false god? Baal, correct? And God raises up a man named Elijah, and he confronts that. Remember the story on the Mount, Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal? It reminds you of what happened in Egypt. Okay, he throws down a challenge. Who's the true God? Okay, who's all powerful? And the prophets of Baal, they're up on the stage of Mount Carmel, go through all of their you know rituals and ceremonies and call down fire upon the altar and what? Right, because their gods have no ears; they can't hear. They're blind. Uh, they're not alive. And then to just kind of make the point to prove that God is powerful and can only do the miraculous, he douses the altar with barrels and barrels of water. And then stands publicly and says, now God, reveal your true power. And send down fire. And he does that and consumes it. Okay? Who's God doing that before? He's, he's doing it before an idolatrous people who need to be called to repentance. Elijah also was sent to a widow, wasn't he? A widow in a place called Zarephath. She and her little son were getting ready to die, to take their last meal. And Elijah meets her and says, please help me, if you could serve me right now, then God will make sure that you don't run out of oil and, and grain. She chooses to do that as an act of faith in the God of Elijah, and what happens, God provides for her. And Elijah eventually uh, heals her son. There are other accounts of this, but the widow of Zarephath, you need to uh, like this, I should say, but the widow of Zarephath illustrates another Gentile. Okay, She wasn't Jewish. But she's demonstrating faith. And you'll see in just a moment that Christ uh, pointed to these examples in the Old Testament to verify and validate that he was to be a Messiah for all peoples, Jews and Gentiles. Well, let me just touch on another example from the Old Testament. It's the story of Daniel. You see that in your notes. Daniel chapter 4. At this point, he and his buddies have been taken captive because of the rebellion of the Israelites brought into Babylon under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, now the most powerful man on the face of the earth, now the one who's conquered all the neighboring nations. And remember the first thing that Daniel and his buddies did when they got into the courts of Pharaoh? You know, these guys are like 11, 12 years old probably, young guys. And they themselves offer a challenge. And they say to their guards, let us not take of the king's meat and wine, but let's eat basically water and vegetables, and see who's healthier at the end of this. Now, as an 11 or 12-year-old, why would you do that? I mean, I think my natural inclination would be, I've just been separated from my family. Maybe they were killed. I don't know. I'm alone in a foreign country. This is the most powerful man, okay, uh, on the face of the planet. Who am I to stand up and to throw down a challenge, right? Let, let alone the enticement to the flesh of the king's wine and his meat. So something had to be motivating Daniel and his buddies to do this. And I think we see lived out in their lives an understanding of the Abrahamic covenant in this sense. 
they say, no, we're going to eat of the vegetables and, and drink of water and reject the king's uh, food. And at the end of the time, we know that they were the strongest and healthiest, right? And for them, it was an exercise of faith. Okay, here we are before Gentile people. We're going to demonstrate that we're, we're going to trust our God to provide for us, to care for us, and to strengthen us. And we know this is true of them because eventually Nebuchadnezzar, who thinks so highly of himself, he also characterizes the unredeemed heart and wanting to be the object of worship. So what does he do? He constructs an idol, a magnificent idol to himself, and he proclaims to the entire nation that when the trumpets blow, you are to bow down and do what? It's the same thing. It's the same principle. Bow down and worship me. The trumpets blow, and you can imagine seeing out in the distance across the heads of thousands and thousands of people who, who bowed down, fallen prostrate before this idol. Three guys out in the distance. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they didn't bow down, right? And their lives were at stake. Why would they not bow down? Because they were taking a stance and saying we are committed to honoring our God, the true God. Even if it means we lose our life in the fiery furnace, but God was gracious and preserved and protected their life. Through the testimony of Daniel and his friends, there was a measure of respect granted to them, and they were uh, afforded positions of leadership within the kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar was this very proud and arrogant man, and he has a dream. And in this dream, if you turn with me to Daniel chapter 4, I want you to see what plays out. He doesn't understand this dream or this vision, and so Daniel's brought in to interpret it. And basically, this vision is one of utter humiliation, uh, prophesying that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be uh, humbled, in a very dramatic fashion. And I want you to, to read how this plays out beginning in verse 28 of chapter 4. It says, All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he's walking on the roof of the royal palace of ba Babylon. Let's stop there. The royal palace of Babylon was recognized as one of the uh, uh, ancient wonders of the ancient world. Okay, If you've ever been to museums or seen pictures of the Ishtar gates, uh, which were brilliantly um, blue-colored enameled bricks that um, surrounded the entire city uh, and his palace. And the reliefs on these, these walls and these gates are all of the gods of the Babylonians. Okay? You could not escape the idolatry in Babylon. It was everywhere around you. And so here's Nebuchadnezzar at the pinnacle of his own palace overlooking these gates and these walls, and he's saying this. Is this not Babylon the great which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? And while the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. And you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beast of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle and seven periods of time will pass over you until what? You recognize that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. And immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and listen to this. I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. What's happening here? Nebuchadnezzar, who himself, he's deified himself as the object of worship. He is filled with an extreme measure of pride. At the moment that he's bragging of all that he's accomplished, God fulfills this vision. A man taken from the highest pinnacle of authority and power and worship that a man could ever drive on this planet is what? reduced to crawling on his belly and can't even care for himself as far as his bodily functions, his hair grows, his nails go. What's, what God, what's God doing there? And please know, it's no secret. The entire nation saw what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. God dethrones him. He humbles him. And then Nebuchadnezzar, once God restores him, makes this statement. 
For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures for, from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Verse 36, and at that time my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. This is the best. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. This is a public testimony of Nebuchadnezzar of repenting and coming to worship the creator. It's a pretty powerful and dramatic story. I don't know about you, but do you expect to actually encounter Nebuchadnezzar one day in heaven? You should, okay? And this is the testimony from the Old Testament of a Gentile king coming to worship God because of the faithful testimony of Daniel and God's work in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Well, the rest of the Old Testament is, is kind of a playing out of this tension of Israel uh, embracing idolatry and rejecting uh, their responsibilities function in this priestly role as a testimony and witness. We don't have time. You could go through the book of Psalms and read many of them that David has authored, which highlight God's purposes uh, to bring salvation to the nations. You can go to the minor prophets as well as the major prophets and see evidence in each of them pointing to God's purpose for the nations, his judgment and his salvation that he wants to extend to them. You might read a book like Hosea that's a confrontation of the Jews' idolatry uh, characterized as adultery against the God who loves them uh, because they refuse to worship him. There are accounts like the story of Jonah, which is another awesome account of Gentiles coming to faith. And this actually is important to note because at this point, because the Jews have been disobedient and unfaithful to their priestly role and being holy, devoted to God, God brought them under the captivity okay, of Assyrians, Babylonians, and so forth. And they came to despise and hate the Gentiles. And at this time, they begin to think that the covenant blessing was exclusive to them. Okay? They changed their theology, if you will. And because they came to hate the Gentiles and saw them as the object of their problems and, and abusive and unjust leadership over them, they begin to reinterpret the covenant to be exclusive to them. And you see that in the story of Jonah, because Jonah uh, is commanded by God to go to the city of Nineveh, right? And this is another Old Testament Sunday school lesson that we tend to get wrong. We, we read there that Sona, uh, Jonah didn't obey, and he read the, uh, fled the opposite direction, right? He went down the city of Tarshish and got on a ship and went the opposite direction of going to Nineveh, which was in the east. Well, you know the account, right? Uh, the storm comes up, he's thrown in the sea, the, the great fish swallows him, uh, he's put out of the fish, and then he goes to Nineveh. And it says there in the book of Jonah that he began to walk a day's journey into the city. It was three days wide, which is about 60 miles wide, major city. He gets about a day's worth in, and he is declaring the message that God told him to bring to the Ninevites. Now, the reason we teach this wrong is we, we say that Jonah was afraid to go to Nineveh. And there's just reason for thinking he was afraid because the Ninevites were the most vicious people on the planet. Uh, when they conquered people and they returned home in victory, they would impale the heads of the people they conquered on post and they would march those in as they came back into the city walls. They would skin uh, those that they had captured and, and drape their skins over the walls of the city. So there's just reason to think you'd be fearful of the Ninevites. But see, Jonah was never afraid of the Ninevites. That wasn't his motive. Because when you come to the last chapter, <clears throat> last two chapters of the book of Jonah, you see that as he went in and was preaching, they all repented. From the king all the way down to the poorest of the servants. And they all humbled themselves in sackcloth, sackcloth and they, uh, in essence, repented of the message of coming judgment to them and uh, asked... Um, or, or recognize that, that God was the true God in that case. Now, anybody, you would think, would be overjoyed. An entire city of Gentiles, these vicious barbarians, come to faith? And what's Jonah's response? 
Anger. It's exactly right. He's sitting out there, right? And I mean, he's so angry, he asked God to take his life. I mean, that's pretty angry. And then he explains why. It, God says, why are you angry? He says, because I knew you would do this. I knew you would repent and that you would forgive the Ninevites. See, the Jews came to so despise the Gentiles that they wanted to keep the promise of the blessing exclusively for their own benefit. And by the time you come to the end of the Old Testament, this is what was consistently the mentality of the Jews. And we know that when Christ came, that's exactly what he experienced. Now, I want to take a few moments to talk about the testimony of Christ. A few things to pick up. Some of these are in your notes, some are not. But if you come to Matthew chapter 1, you begin to read those genealogies. Right, and sometimes your eyes kind of glaze over because they're names you don't even know how to pronounce. But if you read Matthew chapter 1, you're reading about the descendants, and then it says, it mentions, I believe in verse 5, uh, Rahab. And it mentions a lady named Ruth. Who's Ruth? Do you remember that story? Ruth is a Moabite woman who, when her Jewish mother in law, after all their husbands have died, decides to go back to Israel. She makes this statement. She says to Naomi, your people will be my people and what? Your God will be my God. And through the the life uh, of Ruth in that book, we see this wonderful reference to Christ and and what we refer to as the motif of the kinsman redeemer and and what God intends to do uh, to care for those who are broken. And um, it's, it's a beautiful story. But the point is, Ruth professed faith in God. And Rahab and Ruth are two Gentile women included in the genealogy of our Lord. And why would two Gentiles be included with all these Jews if not for the fact that God is purposely saying, even in the lineage of Christ, I'm going to demonstrate, okay, that I'm going to save both Jew and Gentile. Now, you come to Luke chapter 2, and Luke chapter 2 is that wonderful text uh, that we refer to as the nativity narrative. And Mary and Joseph are called out to go to Bethlehem, right? We read that every year. If you're like my family and you sit down uh, to um, open gifts, we read through Luke chapter 2 and talk about Christ being the greatest gift for us, and and he is. And Luke chapter 2 affords us an understanding that at the birth of Christ, God sent angels to some shepherds in the field, Jew or Gentile, by the way. Jew, right? And he calls them to do what? To come worship the king, which they do. They go to the stable and bow down and worship Christ, the newborn uh, king. Well, at the same time this is happening, Matthew 2 tells us that there are wise men in the east who had heard prophecy that one day a, a star would be in the heavens and announcing the birth of a king. At the same time, the shepherds are being, having Christ revealed to them, these Jewish shepherds, also these Gentile wise men are being led from the east to come and bring their gifts of worship as well. Now, I can't be definitive, but from what I've read and studied, many people have derived that it's most likely these Gentile wise men first learned of these prophecies of king probably from the influence of Daniel there in the courts of of Nebuchadnezzar. There were wise men at that time, and we know that uh, Daniel was faithful in his profession uh, of faith in God and Jehovah. And so it's most likely that uh, this was the influence that over generations had informed their expectation. But the point is this. In coming to worship, Uh, In the nativity narrative, you have both Jew and Gentile. And uh, when I travel, one of the things I try to do is pick up a nativity set from the country I'm visiting. And at Christmas time with my kids, we'll get out these nativity sets and we'll set them up. And we know that the the wise men and the shepherds didn't come to the stable at the same time. But in the portrayal of the little nativity set of bringing forth the shepherds and the wise men, I always say to my kids, this is a picture of what God wants to do through the gospel of both Jew and Gentile being called to bow down and worship the newborn king. And you might want to point that out to your kids 
at this Christmas time because this is our hope. I don't know about you, but I'm not Jewish. I don't have any Jewish blood in my body. And my hope as a Gentile is that this, these promises are true and extended to me. And I'm sure that's the case for you as well. <clears throat> well, the text I want you to see is found in Luke chapter 2. And we read this passage often, as I said, at Christmas time, but we stop too early. Verse 20 talks about the shepherds who went back glorifying and praising God for all they'd heard and seen, just as had been told them. And verse 21 picks up the account. It says, And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now catch this. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the spirits brought in the child, Jesus, to carry out for him the custom of the law. Let me just pause there. What's going on? Christ is only eight days old. Okay, he's being dedicated to the temple. Mary and Joseph come in and God prepared a man who he promised he would not die until he saw the Messiah. He imagine Simeon. This elderly man coming into the temple every day with an expectation, when will I see the Messiah? And this is the day. As Mary and Joseph enter in through the gate, he sees in their arms the promise of the Messiah. It says there the Holy Spirit revealed this to him. This is who Christ was. Okay. And Simeon takes the child, it says, in verse 28. And he says, now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Interesting, isn't it? God prepared this man to make a public profession there in the courts of the temple on the very day that Christ comes in to be dedicated. And what he says there is that this child is the Messiah since he was waiting for the hope or consolation or the salvation of Israel. It says, but he is also a light to the Gentiles. Okay? See, the principle is very consistent all the way through. Jew first, then Gentiles. Jew first, then Gentiles. As a matter of fact, Christ came to whom? His own people were Jews, Right? And just as we saw in Genesis chapter 3, we see here, uh, according to Christ's own testimony, that he came to what? To who initiates? He came to seek and save the lost. A good shepherd goes out and looks for his lost sheep. Who initiates? It's God. And the way God initiates is to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And Christ coming to his own people is evidence of that. Now, sadly, they reject it. And I want you to just see a couple of accounts of this. In Luke chapter 4, we continue, continue reading down in verse 24. Now, you, and let, me, let me tee this up for you. Christ is in his hometown, Nazareth, and he goes into the synagogue, and this is where he's unrolled the scrolls, and he's read that passage out of Isaiah that says, I came to set the prisoner free. I came to open the eyes of the blind. Christ is pronouncing publicly that he is the Messiah and the fulfillment of all those messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. That's what's just happened. Okay? And Christ says in verse 24, in, in their response of, of doubt, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Remember that story? Okay, Gentile lady. Verse 27, And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. We didn't talk about that, but after Elijah came Elisha, and you know the story of uh, Naaman, but he's a Gentile. Syrian from Damascus, a, a Syrian military officer. He's got leprosy. He's told to, 
go bathe in uh, the Jordan River seven times to go under the water. And as an act of faith, he does that and is healed. Christ is pointing in this text, listen, this is his first public preaching ministry. Okay? And what does he do? He validates and verifies that he is to be a Messiah for all peoples. And he points explicitly to these two Gentiles who demonstrated faith. And what is the response of the people? They were filled with rage, it says, and they wanted to throw him off the cliffs, but he escaped their grasp. Why were the Jews so hostile towards this reference to Gentiles? Because they hated the Gentiles. They thought the covenant was exclusive to them, but Christ is being very clear, I came to save all people. Okay? He's not an exclusive Messiah. There are other accounts of this uh, you can see in Matthew chapter 8. In this uh, passage, there's a, a crowd of Jews surrounding him, and a Roman centurion comes up to him. He's a Gentile, and he's concerned because his servant is paralyzed. And he comes to Christ and he asks him to heal him. And, and he says there in verse 8, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come. And he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. What? What? Christ is surrounded by a group of Jews. And he points to this Roman centurion, this Gentile, and says, greater faith have I not found in Israel than in this man. You want to talk about public affirmation? That Gentiles are included uh, in the covenant? And then he goes on in, in, in an even more dramatic fashion. He says in verse 11, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, meaning beyond the borders of Israel. And they will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Christ points to the future promises of, of his coming kingdom, promises that had been extended and made to the Jews. And he says, also in the kingdom, reclining there at the table next to whom? The patriarchs are going to be non-Jews and Gentiles. And many of you who do not receive me as your Messiah will be cast out of the kingdom. See, this is what Paul was saying when we looked at Galatians chapter 3. Okay? Those who are true descendants of Abraham are those who demonstrate genuine faith in God. Well, Another example of this will be found in Mark chapter 11. Remember, Christ comes into the temple, and he's outraged, right? Because they've taken a, a portion of the temple there, and they have abused it for their own purposes. They're exploiting people financially um, through the, the sell of animals and, and sacrifices and money lend, lending and all this kind of stuff. And Christ comes in, and he's outraged, okay? And... We don't have the time, but if you go and, and look at Mark chapter 11 and read, read the story there, you'll see that he comes in and he cleanses the temple with a giant whip. And he's just furious. But what he says there is this place that I'm cleansing is actually to be a place of worship for the nations. He's cleansing the court of the Gentiles. And the reason the Jews at that point felt no qualms about turning that part of the temple into a place of dishonor and disrepute and, and, and injustice and, and violating people uh, financially was because they hated the Gentiles. They couldn't even fathom that they were to be included in the covenant. And Christ is not just cleansing the temple, he's cleansing the court of the Gentiles. And this is a bold statement to the Jews. Say this is to be a house of worship for all people. Well, those are just a few examples. There are others where Christ makes his point very clear. But that leads us to come to, of course, the Great Commission passage in Matthew chapter 28. Christ, having risen from the dead, and by the way, uh, prior to this, he's journeyed on the road to Emmaus with a couple of men who don't recognize him. 
And it says there that he went back and he taught through Moses and the prophets. And in essence, what he was doing, I believe, is going back and rehearsing the history of Israel and God's purpose for the nation. And he was the fulfillment of all of that, right? And with that being said, uh, he makes this wonderful pronouncement before his disciples that are saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing the them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. There's a lot that can be said about the Great Commission passage, and I don't intend to preach through it, but I want to make a couple observations. We're instructed here to make disciples, and disciple-making is something much more than just making converts. Disciple-making is bringing people to maturity and faith through the teaching of the scriptures. This is the work of the church. And today in missions, uh, there's a lot of good work that's being done focused on evangelism. But many people today don't have a commitment to the church itself. And so those converts are not being brought into a setting where the scriptures are faithfully being taught. And if we're going to be faithful to fulfill the Great Commission, we can't have this kind of dichotomized thinking about what we're called to do. We're called to make disciples. It begins with making converts, bringing them into the life of the church where they're taught the scriptures so that they can begin to demonstrate faith and obedience and, of course, uh, mature uh, in their own faith. And so a lot of the work that's being done today uh, by people in missions is very evangelistic but with very little interest in the church itself. And that positions a lot of these converts, if they truly are converts, to be very vulnerable to error and heresy and false doctrines and all kinds of things. And particularly where the churches that they, if they are brought into churches, are churches themselves where the men can't handle the scriptures accurately and faithfully. And in a moment, we'll talk a little bit about our work of TMAI and why we feel it's, it's critical uh, to the work of missions and in realizing uh, God's purposes in the Great Commission. But the other thing I want you to see here goes back to this idea of the scope of Christ uh, and God's redemptive purposes for the nations. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. And the language here in Greek is complementary to the language in the Abrahamic covenant of all the families of the earth will be blessed. Here it's all the nations of the earth. So it's very consistent, okay? Now, you're sitting there thinking, we just got to the New Testament and, and time's getting away from us. Tomorrow morning, we're going to preach on the purpose of the church in the world. And we're going to look at the new, some New Testament passages. And my point will be to show you from Scripture how now the church has been called to fulfill a priestly role, okay, and to be a holy people. And we're particularly going to look at the text of 1 Peter chapter 2. But the unfolding of the rest of the New Testament follows uh, Christ's uh, great Commission passage, which complements what's said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He goes on to say that when the Spirit comes, uh, you'll be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And that right there is the outline of the book of Acts. And it's the faithfulness of God to realize that and then to extend it through the work of the church uh, in the days to come. All of Paul's epistles were written on his missionary journeys or in prison in Rome, but they were to Gentile church plants. Okay? Um, but I'm going to jump ahead over the, the New Testament here uh, and take you all the way to the book of Revelation. We know that in Revelation 5 and Revelation chapter 7 that there will be before the throne of God people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And they will be singing what? Worthy is the Lamb. Okay, these are the professions of worship as man was created uh, to offer to the Creator. Matter of fact, we even see God's faithfulness to the promise of the Jew first, or the principle of Jew first, and then to the Gentiles during the tribulation where the 144,000 Jews come to faith. And if you look at the text there in Revelation chapter 7, it illustrates those of the Jews who are saved and then Gentiles as well. So this flows all the way uh, throughout human history and into the future as far as our eschatology and what we can expect. And then you come to Revelation chapter 22. And here we are in the New Jerusalem, okay? 
All has been made new. Satan has been conquered, thrown in the lake of fire. Just as we start in Genesis chapter 1, we conclude here in Revelation chapter 22. And it says this, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Let me stop. One day in heaven, okay, we're going to see the tree of life. Okay. And what does that tree represent? Eternal life, right? It's our hope in God. This has been his offer to us throughout his redemptive plan. But it says there that the tree of life will bear 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and listen, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. My friends, what we will see one day in heaven is the tree of life, and the very leaves on each of its branches are going to be a representation of all the nations to whom God wants to extend that wonderful promise of saving hope. This is God's plan from beginning to end. And for those of us who know Christ as Lord and Savior, who have been given the wonderful truth of the gospel, we must align our lives with God's purpose, no matter where he sets us. If you're a school teacher or an accountant or you're serving in a cross-cultural setting here or abroad, if we understand this is God's purpose, then we have to ask ourselves one question. What role do I play in seeing the nations reached? with the good news of the gospel. And there isn't a more exciting time to live than now as far as the realization of this. You live here in Richmond. I live in Los Angeles. I'm telling you, the nations are here. In the cubicle next to you or in the food line next to you at lunch or, or wherever you're out in the soccer field with your kids on the weekend, the nations are there. And so God's church today needs to be active in its own community, its own neighborhoods, to be faithful to this principle of looking for the opportunities to bring the gospel to bear to idolatrous people. And then as we extend our efforts to see the church strengthen around the world so that people can hear the teaching of God's word effectively and clearly and to be brought to maturity so that they too then what? Can go out and function as priests and be holy people. I don't think there's ever been a more exciting or dynamic uh, age to live in than, than today as far as the fulfillment and the realization of God's purpose for the church. And we want to talk about that even more tomorrow and I'm with you today to discuss some of this. Now, we have just a few more minutes here and uh, if you will, what I'd like to do is um, just introduce you to our ministry a little bit and give you a chance to ask some questions. And uh, if you want to stand or stretch, you're welcome to do that, but I'm trying to uh, keep us uh, to the schedule here so you have enough time uh, to interface and dialogue. And if time permits, I want to talk to you about some trends in missions that you need to be aware of. But um, let's take a moment, and uh, I have a PowerPoint uh, just to kind of share with you about TMAI, the Master's Academy International. I want to go over our mission statement for you. TMAI is committed to fulfilling the Great Commission by training indigenous or national church leaders to be approved pastor teachers, able to equip their churches to make biblically sound disciples. A couple things to focus on here. We believe that the work we're doing is key to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. If teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you is a function of the church, then we've got to make sure the church is able to effectively and accurately teach the Word of God. Um, what we're looking to do is equip and train pastors, uh, elders, church leaders, to be approved pastor teachers. And what I mean by that is not just teachers, but they know how to shepherd people. They know how to bring the truth of God to bear by way of application in their culture and in their life. This goes back to the idea of being a holy people. And so we're committed to train pastor teachers, and, and we have the joy of doing that following the example of uh, my pastor, John MacArthur, uh, committed to expositional preaching, helping men know how to accurately interpret the scriptures using a, a sound set of, of uh, Bible study methods or hermeneutics. 
uh, to really get at the intent of the author. Okay, again, we don't get to insert ourselves as the authority. We have to recognize scripture as the authority and then as best as we possibly can uh, accurately interpret it so that we honor the intent of the author. And uh, that means then we're faithful to Scripture. It's authority, it's inerrancy, it's sufficiency in all things. And in many cultures, uh, the issue of authority is important because uh, particularly in where there's a, a tradition of an oral tradition or a cultural makeup where uh, maybe the, the village leader or the tribal leader is the final word on everything, sometimes that gets carried into national churches where the issue of authority is the man. And what the men we train to do is not make the man the issue, make the scriptures the issue of authority. And if there's an issue of disagreement, uh, then let the scriptures speak to that issue, not personal opinion about that. And so it's really, really important to transition people's loyalty uh, from the uh, authority of a man to the authority of scripture. And uh, the more we faithfully interpret Scripture, the more confidence people have in the Scriptures and explain things that are confusing and realize that there aren't inconsistencies. Um, but Scripture is, is very clear and is consistent. But what do we want these men to do? To preach and teach and, and disciple in such a way that their churches mature. And this is the equipping work that we do in the church so that they can then go on and make new converts and disciples. And For us, this is very important uh, because if the church is faithful to this aspect of ministry, it will be strong, it will be healthy, and we will begin to see the Great Commission extended. This is a little bit of history of TMAI. Uh, We started in 1992 with our first school in the Ukraine. Uh, The wall had just come down uh, basically a year and a half, two years before that. Uh, The Baptist Union leaders in the Ukraine were very concerned. These are the pastors who spent their life in prison. Okay, uh, for their faith. And they began to anticipate that with great freedom was going to come great error. And they didn't believe that their churches and their leaders were trained to the extent that they could be discerning up against just the flooding in of false gospels. And um, they asked for help to train uh, their pastors. And so uh, we tried to respond. We sent a team of four men. And uh, Today, we continue the work there at European Biblical Seminary in the city of Kiev, uh, and it's been a great joy for us to work there. But that then raised up the question by other church leaders in other countries, could you help us do the same? And what you see here is a simple timeline that shows the addition, uh, one school you're very familiar with, and that would be the Word of Grace Biblical Seminary in Mexico City, uh, where Jim uh, served um, for many years and continues to work with them in El Salvador. And so the Lord just continued to open up doors. And our strategy is not a big map on the wall that we say, hey, we need to make a name for masters here and MacArthur here and here. We simply respond where there's an invitation and a work of God in the hearts of church leaders and pastors to say, we want to be equipped to rightly handle the word of God. And in so doing, they might come to our Shepherds Conference and be exposed to that, or maybe they've heard John on the radio or through some other means Uh, and they offer that invitation, and we simply try to provide them with a couple graduates from the Master's Seminary who would simply go and try to reproduce the training that they were given uh, and to serve those pastors there. Today, just to give you a sense of where we're at and what we do, we have 17 training centers that are members of TMAI. Of those 17 schools, uh, we're teaching in 10 different languages. Some are in English as well. But uh, we have over 34 teaching sites because most of the men that we train are bivocational, which means they can't just pick up and quit their jobs to move to a part of the country. But most of our men are on missionary support, thanks to churches like your own, and it frees them up so they can travel. And so we might have a home base, but we'll go out to an extension site and begin to train uh, where there's a good model church and we can have influence there. And... um, Uh, Actually, I need to update this. Right now, we're over uh, 45 different teaching extension sites uh, through the schools, which is wonderful. Of our current student body, which numbers uh, approximately 3,000 students this last year who are being trained, uh, 68 nations are represented. This is really exciting because students come from neighboring countries, are trained, and then they go home. 
And this leads to another aspect of growth for us. And um, right now we're looking at the development of as many as 12 new training centers. Not extension sites, but full training centers. And it's this multiplication effect that's happening. And it's very exciting to see uh, how God's at work. Today we have over 45 full-time uh, national faculty and 38 adjunct um, who come in and, and teach a course. And we've counted about 180 visiting scholars, mostly graduates of TMS who pastor churches here in the States, who their churches support their pastor in going out and teaching. Um, and so it's a, just a wonderful movement. Here's where our training centers are located. Uh, they're in the yellow across the globe. But when you throw in uh, the student bodies that is represented from the other nations, it looks more like this as far as impact. And so we're very, very excited about where God's opening up these new doors. I just was in uh, Myanmar a couple weeks ago uh, with one of our newer schools in development. And that school was started by nine graduates of our school in India. So these are men from Myanmar, went to India to be trained, and came back and now have started a training ministry with the help of some missionaries. So what do we do? We train for theological and expositional um, faithfulness. Uh, we also do a lot of work in the area of foreign language translation. If you're going to teach, you need textbooks. And in a lot of contexts, uh, the better theological resources may not be in their own language. And so we go through the work of translating them, making sure they're accurate. Uh, I think right now we have about 30 projects uh, underway. Uh, one that we were working on recently, uh, the MacArthur Commentary series, all 12 volumes, eight of them have already been translated into Chinese or Mandarin and are in the process, uh, the Lord has provided the funding to print those. So this is an ongoing work all the time, and it's creating a, a, a set of resources for the church at large. We do a lot of conferences through our schools, and um, we always have book tables and bookstores, and we try to bring good resources, biblical counseling, theology, and other areas to strengthen the church. Why do we train uh, national men or indigenous, I should say church leaders? Um, because we believe that they really can be effective uh, in their own language, uh, they understand the culture, and uh, they can most effectively communicate the truth uh, to their own people. And it does something really important. It, it makes Christianity not a Western faith. Okay? It really demonstrates that God's a God of all nations. And when their pastors and their denominational leaders accurately handle the word of God in their own language, make the application in their own culture, this is an affirmation that God's not just an American God. Uh, he is a God for all peoples. We also believe that these men uh, will demonstrate a lifetime of ministry and faithfulness uh, where you might have missionaries come in and out, but this is their home, and, and they're going to demonstrate faithfulness to their church for a lifetime. Uh, maturity, we want them to be men of proven character. We're not interested in uh, pursuing theological education for the sake of scholarship. Um, there's an aspect to that, but we want to make sure that these are men who meet the qualifications for spiritual leadership, and that means they need to be discipled, and our faculty observe their life, both in their homes, in their churches, in the classroom, and can speak into their lives where they see issues that are inconsistent with uh, godly maturity, and uh, in the end, we hope we have graduates who are both biblically sound, but also biblically faithful by way of obedience. Stewardship, when you think about the investment in missions financially, uh, we can invest in a lot of missionaries that go around the world. It's a pretty expensive enterprise, but investing in these men uh, who live according to the local economy and um, don't need outgoing expenses and all these other things, uh, we do believe there's a place for Western missionaries, and, and they've been a big part of what we do. But the larger enterprise is equipping these national men and we believe this provides a greater return on the, on the investment by way of stewardship of a church. <clears throat> Something like this. You know, if we train 30 pastors and their congregations, let's roughly say, have 100 people. Okay, now you've talked about 3,000 people being impacted for the truth. And if they're equipped then to go out and to communicate that truth and make converts. And that's the multiplication uh, factor. And it's not just new converts, but it's also older men... Uh, reproducing themselves in younger men. We talk a lot about our Timothys, and that's based in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and that's looking for faithful men to invest and to equip so that this work will go on into the next generation. Um, 
Obviously, the idea of presence is they're there. They're living this out. Their families are under observation, and they're able to be examples to the flock uh, in all that they do. Um, this just gives you an idea, then, uh, of what it looks like uh, as far as partnership with churches. Uh, we have 56 additional countries today who have extended an invitation to us to help them develop a training ministry. Those aren't just general invitations. Those are specific invitations. Many of them, I, I estimate about 30 of those countries have at least one master seminary graduate already on the field and another one somewhere in the process of being equipped and trained. So these are very real, viable uh, invitations. And uh, we have seven new schools right now in development. Um, and so it just kind of gives you a sense of the impact, uh, uh, the ratio there as far as uh, the truth being extended. So I just wanted to give you that brief overview of TMA. It's an absolute joy uh, to watch what God's doing. Um, there's a hunger and appetite for the truth. And where the Spirit of God truly resides in people, they have a longing to know God and to know the truth. And, and I could tell you these 56 additional countries where we begin to, we're seeing evidence. They're, the churches are weary of the cults and they're weary of the heresies and they're, they're weary of the, the false gospels and things like the prosperity gospel. People have been burned by that and they're looking for biblical truth. And so uh, through our mission and our commitment, we want to step into that gap and do our very best uh, to serve the church to help them discover the joys of faithfully uh, preaching and teaching God's word. So, in a nutshell, that's the work and ministry uh, of TMAI. And uh, you've been very patient uh, listening. I've gone over a lot, both on the theology missions and now giving you some of these uh, highlights of our ministry and work. I want to maybe change the dynamic a little bit and let you just ask me some questions. Um, if you need to stand and stretch, you're welcome to. Uh, we're going to get uh, lunch coming up here soon. Uh, I'm not offended. I tell my students all the time, there's, there's no good time to teach. In the morning, you're tired. Before lunch, you're hungry. After lunch, your stomach's full. In the afternoon, you want to sleep. In the evening, uh, you're tired. So I am not put off by people standing, getting a drink of water, uh, using the restroom. But I do want to redeem the time. So we'll be a little bit more informal here. But let's dialogue a little bit. Uh, it can be on general questions about missions. It can be on the ministry of TMAI. Maybe you've heard some things or have some thoughts about things like Bible translation or uh, things like contextualization, church planting. Does anybody have a question I can answer? Yeah. So, we support missionaries who are with crew in the Jesus Bill. Yeah. And they're studying maps or we people groups and that sort of Yes. So, you don't do that? Are you saying you listen for a Macedonian cause? Like, can you help us? <laughs> uh, we do respond to the invitation of church leaders to come and to train them. Uh, we do have other missionaries that go out through uh, our church who are involved in more evangelistic efforts. So uh, it's not my intention to say this is the only uh, thing in missions that you should do. What we're saying is we feel like this is the most neglected area, and it's our area of specialization that we want to do everything we can to step into that gap. I will say, and this isn't specific to crew, but my earlier comment, there's a lot of well-intended work that's being done by parachurch ministries. But in some parachurch ministries, what you'll find is um, the culture is sometimes uh, anti-church. Uh, and any parachurch ministry, mission agency or any other kind, if they're faithful to the def definition of parachurch, okay, then they're one that uh, you could consider working with if they're theologically sound. But para means coming alongside the church. Now, some people give lip service to that, but a lot of parachurch ministries were started by people who are disillusioned with the church. They're frustrated that their church leadership doesn't have a vision for evangelism or missions or ministry among the poor or whatever it might be. And so they go to start these good works, but there's an, there's an can be an underlying... Uh, uh, critical viewpoint towards the church and that can become fleshed out in their organization where the work that they actually are doing on the front lines shows very little interest or regard to the church itself and that's what I was trying to say um, God's called the church uh, to do the work and if there are people who are disillusioned with the church because their pastors and leaders don't have a vision 
for evangelism and mission, they're probably right. Because that's true in a lot of churches. But I hope I tried to illustrate from Scripture. It's God's priority. And it is a concern of mine when pastors and elders and church leaders see something as missions or evangelism that just gets delegated over here to these people who do this. And it's not something that we understand we're all called to do. So there is just reason why some people have had those experiences. But it can shape a culture in a parachurch ministry that almost becomes anti-church. And this isn't specific to crew. You have to assess that with your missionaries and, and whatever organizations you work with. But the only eternal institution that God's ordained is the church. It's not the master's university, the master's seminary. It's not even TMAI. It's the church. And so if we want to realize God's purposes and plans, then we have to work on behalf of the church. And um, that was more than what you were asking for, brother. But as you assess what you invest in, that's one of the things I would be looking for. Are they church men, church women? Um, otherwise, we, we create converts, and they're just vulnerable. And there's a big word they use in missions called syncretism. And the reason syncretism is the blending of two faiths. And sometimes it's Christianity with their former animism or false world religion. It gets all mixed up. And the reason is that person wasn't discipled through the scriptures to edit out still the error that they believe. Or if they're not being discipled under the authority of scripture, then they're very vulnerable to embrace false teaching. And so this is the greater concern when we talk about parachurch ministries uh, if they're not faithful to the church and a high view of scripture, uh, it can actually cause some real, real problems. Uh, even to the extent some people who profess the name of Christ uh, and maybe not actually be saved. Um, and this is one of the trends that we see happening in missions today, which is this very pragmatic approach. Uh, we talk about rapid church planting. Okay. And uh, I think the Jesus film is a great tool. Uh, I, I show it in my class and we talk about how to use it. But sometimes people are using the Jesus film. They, sh they throw a sheet up, show the Jesus film, and then uh, they roll on to the next village. And there were, you know, five people who profess Christ, and therefore a church is planted, and I can move on. But if you look at the New Testament, for instance, Paul sent uh, Titus to the island of Crete to what? Raise up leaders, elders that could lead the church. And um, in the name of our own success in making converts as Americans, because we're very number-oriented, that's how we just define success, um, we're, we're telling people that they're the church, and a lot of times we just leave them vulnerable because we haven't brought them into the church or we haven't done the hard work of discipling and raising up leaders. So uh, that's a general observation and and it's not intended to be a direct criticism or cru crusade or anybody else, but that's the grid I think we've got to think through. Well, I have one statement. To the credit of our elders and Jim Dowdy, we've been well taught and through visiting missionaries, we've been well taught that the church is not the priority of the indigenous pastor. Okay. Now Wonderful. And the local church. That's Good. And that is your testimony. That's what I've heard as well. But we have to help other churches and people think through these issues, don't we? So thank you. Great question. Other questions? Yes. Knowing what's happening to a lot of denominational churches today, how often do you chance to speak to denominational churches? Yeah. Well, let me answer that a couple ways. First of all, in all of the contexts that we teach, um, there are large denominations. I, mean, I just said I was in, in Myanmar. One of the largest denominations is the Kachin Baptist denomination. And uh, matter of fact, Rick's roommate was a guy named Nadin, who is now the chairman of the New Testament program at their biggest seminary. Okay. So here's an established denomination. Uh, the challenge that they face in that case, this is an example, is where the Kachin people live in Myanmar uh, is the one area in Asia that produces the most jade. And because of the corruption in that country and the military juntas that have run that until recently, they have been exploiting the people in the Kachin state. And so there are a lot of people in the Kachin church, Kachin church who identify as Baptist, who are against the government and are actually rebels. And so one of our missionaries was invited there to speak at a conference, and the students asked the question, should we submit to the government? 
So he went back and he says, well, this is what the scriptures teach. Well, guess what? The denominational leaders did not like that. And so they forbid him from coming back and teaching. So what you'll often find within established denominations are, are either, um, let me put this way, often they exist because of faithful missionary endeavors historically. And even their doctrinal statements uh, that they claim they hold to would still be conservative and maybe consistent with your own churches. The reality is over time, and particularly as missionaries left, um, they may have been vulnerable to other political dynamics and or uh, theological errors. And, um, and so you'll find politics that exists sometimes in those denominations. And so as we train men, men from those denominations have to go back and very wisely, faithfully teach God's word and try to bring other leaders along. And, and under the sovereignty of God and his purposes, Sometimes we've had great influence and effect to that. And see, entire I can tell you about the denomination. Well, back in the Ukraine, um, it was one of our graduates who was able to rewrite the entire doctrinal statement for uh, Odessa Theological Seminary, which is one of the other leading seminaries in the country. And uh, the president of that seminary who asked him to do that is now the vice president for all theological education for the Ukraine and asked him to come help him do that. So we are having influence and effect at the highest levels. Uh, I know another brother who serves in Uganda, and uh, he was able to work with the Baptist pastors at their invitation to rewrite uh, the doctrinal statement of the Baptist denomination in Uganda. And uh, the Baptist denomination in Kenya, as well as the new country of southern Sudan, have also extended invitations uh, to have helped kind of review their doctrinal positions. So our guys are having that kind of high-level influence, but also down in the trenches, sometimes it can be a you know, a, a difficult fight. Um, uh, but the issue, again, is, is letting Scripture speak uh, authoritatively. Does that speak to your question a little bit? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if we're talking about the mainline denominations like uh, the, the Lutherans and the Methodists and all these, and all of them had historic missions efforts. I mean, leaders in the Presbyterian Church, Lutheran Church, Methodist Church, all throughout Asia, for instance. So often you'll find those denominations really well entrenched. This is a, a large generalization, but uh, speaking generally, up until, I'd say, the 1980s, those denominations... Uh, remain more conservative than their branches in the U.S. But as liberalism came to infect those denominations in the last hundred years in the U.S., what's happened is those denominations have been very aggressive in scholarshiping international students from the seminaries and the denominations around the world that their missionaries established. So they come to the States, they're trained, and in essence, Scripture is diminished they become skeptics, okay, or critics of the scripture, and then they carry that back into their seminaries and uh, denominational uh, viewpoints. And so we've watched this now in the last 30 years go from the U.S. and its liberalism now being exported aggressively. And I can't think of a place where we train that there aren't many other seminaries. Seminaries aren't new, um, Faithful missionaries, maybe 60, 70 years, birthed a lot of evangelical sound seminaries. But today they've been corrupted uh, by bringing their best and brightest here who go back to be the deans of those schools or their faculty. And this is true even uh, not just among mainline denominational schools, but also those who identify as evangelical. Uh, one of the schools that's had the greatest influence internationally has been Fuller Theological Seminary. Their, their School of World Missions, which historically was their most conservative school uh, by the 80s, had just completely abandoned that. But they were the school to go to if you were an international, uh, wanted to be a dean of a school or, or head of a denomination. And at Fuller, uh, they don't hold to the inerrancy of scripture, a biblical view of the role of women, and on and on I could go. 
And so we bring these great guys. Many of them love Christ. They were faithfully uh, brought to faith in a good church. And they come to a school like Fuller only to have their faith dismantled, their confidence in the scriptures. And then they go back and they're the ones that make all the hiring decisions for their faculty and so forth. The other thing that we've imported uh, in this fashion has been a, a very highly pragmatic approach to missions, which is very numbers oriented. And um, uh, not to go into great detail, but there's, there's some different trends uh, that look at elevating the culture as the authority over scripture. And in the end, it compromises their approach to Bible translation, uh, church planting, and a whole host of other things. And a lot of that was birthed out of school like Fuller Seminary. So uh, it's not a pretty picture globally from a denominational perspective. Um, and that's why I was saying earlier, for me, knowing that and be able to give testimony about what God's doing, where there's a, a real appetite uh, to once again to, to discover how to preach and teach God's word. And so you, you want to respond to that. We want to go everywhere we can and, and see God's church raise up and invest and provide the resources so we can uh, answer those questions. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so you can give to TMAI uh, a couple different ways. A lot of churches, uh, as a church, uh, would like to make a gift to TMAI to undergird the, the support. And to do that as part of your monthly missions budget, that might be something uh, to consider. You have a choice. You can either give that money to TMAI as an undesignated gift, just to the Master's Academy International which gives us the freedom to utilize that where we know the most critical and immediate need is. We appreciate that. But the other thing that we encourage churches to do is actually identify a school or two or three and say, these are schools we want to have a relationship with. We want to uh, get to know who their faculty are, hear the testimonies of their students. We like to send a short-term missions trip. We'd like to uh, send our pastor to go and teach. And so we have what we call our ambassador program which works with churches to create that kind of relationship with a particular training center. So when the church gives, then they can designate that gift to that school. And we don't take a cent of it. It just goes straight to, the, to, to their budget and, and meets their needs. And um, our first commitment financially is make sure they can keep the lights on. And uh, we go to fund the school in a way that offsets the amount of money that the students can pay by way of tuition. All of our students pay tuition so that they value what they're getting. But it doesn't mean that in that context, economically, they can support the whole enterprise. Um, and so we give gifts to meet those, those schools so they can offer that education to the students. Um, but every school submits to us annually a list of special needs or projects. It might be Bible translation projects. It might be a, a capital project. Maybe they need to refurbish uh, a classroom. Our, our school in the Czech Republic is in a historic building, and one of their rooms is in the basement where they had the library. But the building was built in the 1800s, and so it wasn't weatherproofed. And so the water seeped in and uh, ruined the books that they had there. So we had to go back and weatherproof that um, so they submit to us projects, faculty development, so they could go on and complete their education at, at the seminary so they can teach the more advanced level uh, Masters of Divinity courses. So we have a set of those, but we earmark them independently. And every year, and we'll do this at the end of this year, is we project what those projects are for the upcoming year, and then you can give towards those projects if you'd like to. But um, our first priority is make sure that they can continue to do what they primarily do, and then we do the projects. Individuals can do the same thing, to answer your question. So you can give generally to TMAI and allow us to distribute that as needed, uh, where the critical needs are, or you can select an agency. And maybe you support a missionary, or you know of a missionary, or, or somebody who's serving at a school like that, or you have some other connection to the country, and you have uh, a particular interest. You can give and designate your gift uh, to them, a one-time gift or monthly giving uh, to them, and or uh, you can also give to special projects. So I think 
the distinction between giving generally or in a designated way is both an opportunity for a church and an individual. And we need both. So. Yeah, uh, we can serve some different models early on, kind of like a compassion model where you could adopt. So, and uh, and looking at that, we cho- we decided that wasn't the better thing to do. Um, some un- unintended things can happen in that model. Uh, once that pastor is receiving money from you, he graduates. Guess who he's going to keep coming back to and asking for more money, and so it can create some dependency challenges and some issues. Um, and so we've learned that that's not the better way to do it, but to trust the leadership of the school to cover their expenses so they can discount the cost to every student and then all the men who are qualified uh, to come and train have opportunity to benefit from it. So we don't give out individual scholarships. We discount uh, the cost to the student, to everybody. So we think that's a wiser way to go. Now that doesn't mean you can't, get testimonies about individual students and pray for them and things like that. We do try to provide those up the chain as we report back to our supporters. Thank you for asking that. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, we have what we call the pathway to membership. And it, it lines out a process for those who are interested that they'll have to go through. And our basic criteria to have a school become a member of TMAI and to receive funds for us and all the other accountability that it provides. Uh, we provide three kinds of accountability through TMAI. Theological, first of all. Every one of our faculty members, and if there's a national board over that school, every board member has to sign our doctrinal statement annually stating that they agree with it. So it's, it's real tight. This is where a lot of schools drift and wander, and uh, we know that. So the second is academic uh, accountability, that when our schools are saying they're offering a bachelor's or a master's program, that that is keyed to a standard that is recognized uh, both in the U.S. and internationally. And so we want to make sure that the reputation academically is uh, faithful. Third is financial accountability. And all of our schools submit their budgets and um, report back to us on any gifts that are given to them, how they're utilized, and so forth. And so we have those things in place. Um, But the rubric for uh, then bringing a school into that uh, status as a member is they have to have two graduates of the master's seminary on the field. That's another point of our accountability, somebody we've trained uh, that we trust. Uh, Second of all, they have to have two model churches. And this goes back to really uh, our philosophy of education at the Master Seminary that's housed on the campus of Grace Community Church. We want them to see what a biblical church looks like. And this is getting away from just theological education that is isolated from the local church. We want them to actually be mentored by pastors, disciple and given an opportunity to see what a biblical philosophy of ministry looks like in the church. So two graduates, two model churches. They have to have signed our doctrinal statement, meaning all the faculty, for at least two years. Because see, all these, these folks, are, they do start training in their churches. They just may not be full members of TMAI. Um, and after they've proven that to us for two years, uh, then we move them into what we call a candidate phase. And at that, play, at that time, we work with them to develop their full academic plan, their business plan, their uh, development strategy, um, uh, and several other pieces. And so once that's mapped out, uh, then our board will approve them for membership. So we want them to thrive. We want them to succeed uh, into the future. So the 17 schools we have right now are in compliance with those requirements. The ones in development are in the process of putting those things in place. And when they do, then our board will uh, accept their application for membership. So, yeah. But we state that up front. It's real clear to everybody uh, what they need to do. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, no, we don't base it on that. We just know the Lord will provide. And we issue grants from TMAI based on the gifts that we're given. And, um, and uh, just to give you a sense of what it costs, uh, just to operate the schools, those 17 schools, by way of the support that we provide, it's about $3.5 million annually is what we need to raise uh, to do that. It doesn't really reflect the, the true cost because uh, there's another $3.5 million that's represented in missionary support of the missionaries who are teaching at those training centers. So the whole enterprise is more like a $7 million enterprise. And we watch the Lord provide every year. and We walk by faith and do that. Uh, if we don't have the funds, we can't pass them on uh, to the school. But um, we believe that our mission is in line with God's purposes and plan, and he'll provide for us. Uh, and that's a big part of my job is telling that story and helping people understand what our, our need is. So thanks for asking. That helps me out. I guess the other thing I would say in that regard, and, and you asked about individuals and I don't know your church family here, but all of you represent relationships. And sometimes in those relationships, there's people who love Christ and they have financial resources that are available to them. And we're as grateful for the faithful person who gives the, the 10 or $20 every month. We love that. We don't make a distinction. Um, but we also are looking for people who are saying, I'm looking for a place to invest really strategically for the kingdom from my investments or the resources the Lord has provided through my company or something like that. And so it may not be you. You may have limited resources and, and you give generously as the Lord provides. But if you know of other people uh, who would be like-minded with us and you wouldn't mind making an introduction to us, that's very helpful. And we see the Lord growing a number of people who are kind of uh, legacy givers or people who, who want to put TMAI into their estate plan or some things that look more towards the future. And so that's also a possibility. Uh, we're grateful when we're included in a, uh, in a state or there's a piece of property or something that's given. Um, and we believe that, if you want to talk in, in basic terms, we have a product uh, that uh, is, is, can be trusted. And um, people can have confidence that there's the accountability in place to make sure what their gifts are given towards will be used uh, faithfully. And uh, I know when you write that check, a lot of us just give, but, but there are those who, they do ask that question. They want to know. And so we believe you build trust by communicating respectfully as to how the gifts are used, and that helps increase uh, people's confidence. So, All right. You've been sitting a long time, and uh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here for a while, so I'm going to pass things over uh, to Bill. Thank you so much for your attention this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mark, for blessing us with the word and just encouraging us in the whole aspect of missions. I wanted to mention briefly that uh, even as Mark was talking about their works around the world, we as a missions leadership team and the elders are talking through and looking at uh, partnering even tighter with TMAI as they are theologically aligned with us and philosophically as well. And so we're already partnered with them through the work that we're supporting in Mexico City with Jim and Carolyn and their ministry there and in El Salvador. And we're also looking at another uh, area of the world, and that is India. You say, why India? Well, they have a work in India, and we have in our body uh, two member families who are actually represented here this morning from India who have a heart to see the gospel go out to their home country and so when we learned that they have a work there that could use some help, uh, some encouragement, and even some financial support, we thought, wow, here we have a piece of India right in Midlothian. And uh, there's already been trips that I know Alwyn and Shermalee have taken back to visit family and carried gospel books to, to share with their family. So in January, Alwyn and myself are going to, we're planning a trip right now to travel to Goa, in India and visit this seminary work and get kind of a first-hand look at what's going on, bring a report back, and Lord willing, even take on another uh, aspect of TMAI to help, help this work there. And who knows what the Lord might do even through 
some of our members here and their heart for their home country. So look forward to hearing more about that in the coming months. If you take your bulletin that you got today and open it up, you'll see that there is a, a TMAI card in there. And this is just for uh, ministry updates and information purposes. If you would like to receive more information on what's going on at the seminary extensions around the world, fill that card out. And there are baskets on each side of the auditorium as you're exiting. You could just drop it in there and we'll make sure that Mark gets those and that you can start receiving some updates from TMAI if you're not already doing that. I said I was going to have another book giveaway. And so that's what we're going to do. Who likes to read? Hey, we got a lot of readers. Good. Who thinks they came from the furthest away this morning? Besides Mark. Besides Mark. <laughs> yeah. Who thinks they came the furthest away? If you, if you drove uh, 